Um, so we're going to have a session where we'll go through um, the evidence and uh, the different research approaches that are being used across the continent. Um, so for that, I would like to check if Eloise is connected online. Eloise, are you there? Ah, okay. So I'll yeah. hand it over to both Eloise and uh, Kiros, who's here with us, um, to take us through this session. Both of them will be our session chairs. Uh, welcome, Eloise. Great, thanks, Victor. Well, don't put down the mic because you're first up <laughs> for this session. Um, and so I'm going to spend very little time introducing this session because Victor is really setting the stage um, for the session that we're going to have today. Uh, and so before I introduce Victor, I also want to say that uh, we are exceptionally grateful for the work that he's done uh, for this workshop. He's been instrumental in putting together a really spectacular program and for tolerating our uh, critiques and um, uh, helpful feedback. <laughs> uh, so Victor is an environmental health specialist with experience in environmental management and pollution control in low and middle income countries in Africa, Asia and Latin America. He has extensive experience in environmental monitoring and policy evaluation and also contributes to expertise to a range of initiatives aimed at promoting improved air quality in East Africa. Uh, Victor also has a deep interest in the development of norms and best practices to address environmental issues and also integrate these in policies and strategies. And so I'll hand over to Victor, who's going to talk to us about air quality and health in East Africa from a SOGA perspective. The stage is yours. Thank you. Um, thank you for the introduction, Eloise. So, so my job here is very simple, is to set a stage for um, what we'll um, eventually hear about in terms of uh, the evidence available. And it's really to give you a global snapshot of what we um, see as the health effects of air pollution uh, using global analysis. Um, this is what we do at the Health Effects Institute for the State of Global Air Initiative. Uh, it's a collaboration between ourselves and the Institute of Health Metrics and Evaluation. And we use data from the Global Burden of Disease Study. Um, I will not go into the numbers, but I will use the data to sort of uh, start a conversation on some of the things you're seeing and trends you're seeing and seemingly may or may not be able to explain from a health perspective, from an air pollution perspective. Uh, hopefully that elicits some discussion. And you know, the presenters who come after me will go into more detail in terms of you know, sources and techniques for monitoring and other methods that are being used across the continent. So just in brief, um, if you haven't uh, seen the report, uh, on your tables, there's um, printouts, uh, there's QR codes. Um, one of them is for the report, you can download the report. It looks at Africa as a continent, and you can look at some of the data in there. So I'll just briefly go through some of what we are seeing using this global analysis. Um, the health burden is high. Again, not emphasis on the numbers. Different analyses come up with different numbers. But the grand message is that there's a problem, and it's a health problem. Uh, Philip alluded to it being potentially an economic problem. Uh, we are yet to see how that analysis comes about. And, you know, it's an environmental problem as well. Um, so it is a problem, and that's why we are here, and that's why we have to deal with it. Uh, there's difference in exposure depending on where you are on the continent. And the map that I'll show next will show that. Um, household air pollution, uh, which is a dicey subject, uh, is a big contributor to our burden of disease compared to ambient PM 2.5. Um, and you know, there's varying degrees of contribution in terms of sources, depending where you are on the continent. I think Karadi spoke about South Africa, where there's huge demand for energy, they use coal, so you would expect that to be a driver, a leading source. Uh, Kenya, we may hear from George in terms of their work and see how Nairobi is doing. Um, so this is uh, just a map that you've seen before, and analysis that you've seen before. Uh, what the G GBD is able to show us is a trend over time. So this is 1990 to 2019. Uh, the black line is a global average. Uh, you may see a few countries are above that. So Egypt, Ghana, uh, way above the global average in terms of pollution exposure to ambient PM 2.5. Personal um, trends over 2019, from 2010 to 2019. So different stories depending on where you are on the continent. Uh, Kenya is perhaps uh, the lowest there. And you know, uh, open question to the Kenyan colleagues in the room. Um, 
What I want to emphasize on is where the gaps are in how we come about with not just these estimates, but also other estimates. So to get to that estimate, uh, we use a lot of data, and data in varying forms. So for where you have ground monitors would be the perfect case. So ground level pollution exposure to individuals. If you lack that, trans chemical transport models or you know models that sort of um, apply env environmental, you know, atmospheric chemistry analysis and all that, you can use satellite data as well. Uh, I've carefully chosen my words on this one, and I'm saying limited <laughs> ground monitoring. And that's a message that I want to maybe emphasize. Uh, we have Airco here who's been monitoring for some time. So how come we always say we are lacking data in Africa? It's good for a proposal, but let's think about that. Uh, <laughs> WRI is, mon is going to deploy, you know, the city of Nairobi has up to six partners who are doing monitoring. So how come we are still lacking data? So we need to, same for Addis, same for, I can give examples in Kampala, Addis, and other cities around East Africa. So my choice of words is very deliberate there. It's limited. And what that means when it's limited, your analysis has a bigger bias, or it's the estimates have a bigger bias. So for example, if I tell you, deaths in Kenya is 17,000 from household air pollution. It could be 25, it could be 5,000. So the idea and how we are coming into this space as HEI, how can we work together to bring that estimate or you know, bias closer to, as close as possible. It's never perfect for those, the researchers in the room. And that's what we are all about. And you know, I have a lot of slides, but uh, that's essentially that summarizes my slides. By the way, uh, is that you know we want to work together with you to sort of see that you know um, these estimates are make some sense. It could be global estimates. It could be those that you have, but also to enable you to do that kind of research that's owned. Currently mentioned local ownership in terms of the research. That's also a way to go. So that's the first part of you know, that analysis, is getting the data um, into the system and seeing what's the exposure level in terms of particulate matter. So we're being specific on one pollutant here. Household air pollution, uh, we can't escape this. I think um, I will not belabor the point here. Exposure is high. It's risky for mothers and children. Uh, we'll see in a couple of slides why that's the case. Uh, in our analysis for the report, we found that 236,000, mm, something like that, kids are, you know, die prematurely because of exposure to household air pollution in particular. Um, so I will not belabor the point there. We'll hear tomorrow from a group that's doing a lot of good work on in the household air pollution space based here in Kenya at Kemri, how they are going about, you know, interventions in that space. Um, again, interesting dynamic here. So remember the first graph we saw where we had ambient air pollution and the levels were, you know, some going up and down. So for households, if you look at the trend since 2010 to 2019, seemingly it's going down. Again, open question, why would that, why would that be the case? Is it we are ventilating? Is it cook stoves? I don't know. Uh, but you're seeing that trend over time um, from this global data set. So this is, uh, this is Kenya, and what we are looking at here is the distribution of um, burden linked to air pollution by age. Um, I don't know if you, I was surprised the first time I saw this by this first bar here. So kids under 28, that's where the biggest burden is, and again, it's an open question why that would be. Would it be exposure to household air pollution, you know, in that space? Again, the elderly. Um, another big peak there. So the, is it orange? Is household air pollution? The green, if it's not very clear to you, is you know uh, ambient air pollution. So we have a huge issue with household air pollution and you need to think about that. Pattern is not too different in Uganda. You may notice the scale is different. We have 4,000 there, we have 8,000 here, which means you know it's just a heavier burden in Uganda. Um, I don't know if my Ugandan friends will punch me in the face or something, but I think Uganda is more rural than Kenya. We can discuss that over lunch. <laughs> 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 
and whether that contributes to this observation, I don't know. Um, I've only been to Kampala, by the way, so that's not a fair thing to say. Um, again, so this is now on the health side. How do we get to these estimates? Um, so I think Bob alluded to some of this. We need to come up with dose response functions, in which case we're just saying, you know, you're, you're walking by the street, there's an emission coming from a car, there's concentrations. How does that get into your system? How does that dose relate to the outcome? Um, a lot of work needs to go in there. Again, deliberate choice of words, limited studies on health. My last slide will show why I'm saying limited studies. Um, and limited availability of baseline disease rates um, in, in the African context. So we are very much looking at how we can play a role in that space as HEI. Not just that limited space, but also broader because air quality is also, air pollution is also uh, much broader than this. So full picture here, just to show you, you know, the whole range of how we arrived to, you know, burden disease linked to air pollution. You have your data, a minimum risk exposure level, you try to, you know, assimilate all that. And you use your dose response functions to sort of elucidate what percentage or proportion of your population would be burdened by A, B, C, D outcome. And the outcomes are many. We are beginning to see more and more outcomes as we uh, sort of move along. Maybe 10 years ago, it was only, you know, respiratory. Now we know PM 2.5 goes into your system. Blood-brain barrier can go to your, you know, cardiovascular system, affects dementia, things like those, type 2 diabetes. And who knows, maybe in a few years we'll know a bit more and we'll be able to sort of link this to other disease outcomes. Um, so it's, it's, from a research perspective, it's an interesting dynamic. Uh, very briefly, again, when you speak about sources, this is a project we had called GBD Maps. So we try to map air pollution sources by country. Um, again, I won't dwell a lot on this, but you can see some of your strengths. I mean, if you're looking at this, you know, some of what uh, Karidi already alluded to, South Africa is 22% energy production. Uh, Kenya here is 26% residential. Could be open burning, could be, you know. Yeah, so I'm just generating questions in your mind uh, for this discussion and broader discussions later in the, uh, later in the day. Um, Ghana, DRC, it's a different dynamic and it varies by, you know, where you are on the continent. The countries have been carefully selected to represent sub-regions. East, uh, east, west, north, south, central. That's why you see that, um, that spread. Uh, yeah, so coming to my final slide where I said limited for the health evidence. So the question then becomes how are you gonna start looking at this area and how are you gonna start tackling this? So what we've done as HEI, just as an initial step, uh, we've developed this interactive database. It's, it's, you could call it many things. It's, it's like a, a mapping of the studies. Um, so obviously Kenya is very dark, meaning many of the health studies we have found so far are from Kenya. We are inviting you to send your studies to us. We have about 80 articles. We would like this to grow to as many as possible. Uh, we are tracking, I think, seven health outcomes, seven different health outcomes. And you know, the, the idea here is to say um, the evidence is there. We need to sort of uh, look at where the gaps are within that evidence and, you know, move to some action, some form of action, or interventions, as again, Karadi um, alluded to. So this is available um, on our website, and you know, um, welcome any input and feedback from you guys. So that's it from me. Again, the hashtag is East Africa AQ 2023 for those of you who are on Twitter, which is, I guess, one of the predominant social media. Thank you so much. Super, thanks Victor, especially for setting up um, some challenges for the community to address uh, knowledge and data gaps. I think now I hand over to my co-chair. We have five minutes for, for Q&A. Um, yeah, so Kiros, over to you. Yeah, since I'm in the room, I'm only if you have, I'm actually gonna take some questions from the audience. Tom. Yeah, can, you, can everyone hear me? Yeah, yeah. Good, good morning again. Uh, thanks Elois again, uh, if you haven't heard me before. So before we go on the next speaker, if there are any burning questions, uh, please raise your hand so that we can uh, discuss any questions for Victor. So make the questions as brief as you can. Yeah, I have a story to give. 
Anyway, <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, Victor, I think there's um, just a, a, a quick one. The, the data for, you know, the source apportionment um, for residential, uh, for Kenya, you, you give like about 27%. And I'm wondering whether it's for the entire, I mean, the whole country or, okay, specific areas. Because I think there was a, a study in, in 2014 that showed, like, for Nairobi, but m maybe this was ambient air pollution, was only 6%. So I just needed to find out that. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Um, that's why I said I want to deliberately stay away from numbers and sources. Because, again, it's an issue of scale. So what I've showed is national scale. Um, you could apply different techniques and arrive at a different conclusion. It really depends on which techniques you have available to you. And I think we'll hear about some of those techniques in the course of this session. Uh, so just to answer your question, it's national scale. And it's used, you know, we could refine it better, which is something we would want to try and do so that we arrive at, you know, something that makes a bit more sense, I can say, for lack of a better term. Yeah, but you could find different outcomes depending on city scale. Or you know, even if you do two counties or something like that. Okay. All right. Uh, thank you very much. I don't see any hands up, so we'll probably go to the next speaker. Oh, we have one more question. I see Victor is frowning. <laughs> yes, Victor. Um, I think uh, mine is uh, a comment and also trying to get the picture of. Uh, uh, Kenya and East Africa, uh, because you've been dealing with, uh, you know, these countries. And it's about, you know, the data. Um, uh, sometimes you talk about, you talked about data, many partners involved, etc., cetera, um, in trying to monitor air pollution within these regions. And my inquiry is about, you know, what is the, have you looked into the data capacity uh, in terms of uh, availability of this data to the people who want to communicate to their ability to analyze it and probably integrate it into policy and practice. And I, for me, I think that's very, very crucial because sometimes we end up, um, as an academic, we end up speaking among, among us ourselves and you know we feel we understand, but you know the, the people are supposed to help us with kind of with this movement, pushing it forward, um, you know, may not really try to understand the data or may not really have easy access to the data. So I want to get from your experience how how that is on the general East African overview or African overview. Thank you. Um, thanks, Gabriel. I was worried because I thought you would want to handle the whole rural versus urban issue. Uh, anyway, thanks for that question. So I think there's many ways to do that. So I'll start from our perspective. As HEI, we really emphasize a lot on science communication. So most of the work we do, including for SOGA, it's, it's hardcore GBD may not be under broadly understand, understandable to everyone. So what we do, is, and you've read, you've read our reports, um, we sort of take that and put it in a language that's more assimilated by a wider, broader base. So that's one way of doing it. Beyond that, I think there's tec different techniques depending on uh, who you are. If you're an airco, there is community engagement, there is apps for that. So just to get this data in the hands of the people who may need it the most. Um, there's a broad of options, I would say, uh, but I'll just tackle this from our perspective and not want to steal the thunder from colleagues as well, because I'm sure maybe some of them will want to say a, f a bit on that. Thanks. Great. Yeah. Thanks, Victor. Let's uh, thank Victor once more. Okay, we'll have a little bit of discussion time at the end if there are any remaining questions. So our next speaker is going to be Dr. George Moaniki from uh, WRI Africa. Uh, he's going to speak on the topic of current air quality landscape in East Africa. Dr. George Moaniki is Head of Air Quality for FWRI, WRI Africa, based in Addis Ababa. Uh, he has doctorate in environmental science from Washington State University, master's in environmental engineering from Montana Tech at the University of Montana, and a bachelor from the University of Nairobi in environmental and biosystems. And his work focuses on working with stakeholders across the continent, including policymakers, civil society, communities, private sector, and uh, you know the whole range of uh, stakeholders. So, Dr. Moaniki. Generous introduction. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, in the in the air quality space in Kenya, uh, you might encounter people calling me honey. Um, and the reason for that is my last name, George Mwaniki. Uh, Mwaniki refers, in, traditionally, is, is a honey farmer. So that means my great-great-grandfather was a honey farmer. So in the space, I say, when you forget my name, just call me honey. I'll respond. <laughs> And I, I was requested to talk a little bit about uh, air pollution in East Africa, what's happening. And like my friend Jerry Opondo, I'm also a storyteller. So I'll tell you a story and then you'll figure out really what's happening in the sector. But one of the things I would mention, because this is a, a, is a health institute kind of uh, workshop, one of the things I would say is as air quality practitioners in the region, Maybe we need to uh, think how we reframe the challenge. Uh, because one of the stories I like saying is, there was a day I was having a whiskey with a policy maker from Africa. And I mentioned that uh, in Africa, around 1.4 people are dying from air pollution issues. And the policy maker was not able to connect with that statement. Uh, you connect with a statement on death if it's really very close to you, is when you feel it. But if you're talking about the region, the city, the country, sometimes it doesn't connect. But when we say to the policymaker, you know air pollution could be driving 30% of your health budget, now I got his attention. Uh, so let's talk about issues of health and death, but also let us include issues of budget and money. And, and this is a continent that is really strained uh, on that part. So that, that is, a, is a message that really uh, resonates. Uh, we're also discussing a lot of issues today in the morning about research question, data question. I, I, I can say without fear of contradiction, we don't have data in this part of the continent. Uh, if we are looking for air quality data in Nairobi, it's very difficult to get data that was collected continuously for one year with an instrument that you can trust for one year. There are some instruments you can trust for three months, four months or so. And for example, for Nairobi, one of the longest data being collected for air pollution is at the U.S. Embassy. Uh, for those of you who know where U.S. Embassy is, there is a huge forest between Nairobi and the US Embassy. So basically what we are seeing on that monitor is background data. Uh, so we really lack data. And for those uh, from the county and from the national government who are here, we have been discussing a couple of times that there is a lot of people coming to those offices requesting for support letters. When they are writing proposals uh, to do the research, and the county and national government are very generous. They give those letters saying we are experiencing these challenges, but the county um, kind of told me this in confidence. And this is one of the lessons. Please don't tell me anything in confidence. I'm going to announce it here. <laughs> um, that once they give those letters, they don't hear from these professors and researchers, but a couple of years later, they see a paper published on air pollution in Nairobi, and then they remember that letter. So let, let's create more stronger uh, communities, um, and let's engage and share our data uh, openly. Uh, but again, having said that, I don't think we have to wait as policymakers or people who are supporting action to reduce air pollution until that time when we have perfect data. Uh, we do have enough information to start taking action now. Um, and I think I'll, I'll talk about this later. I, for me, I think air pollution in Africa is more of an investment challenge rather than a research question. It's obviously a good research question, but also is a major investment challenge. Now, to, to my story on uh, air pollution and, and where Africa is, I, I want you to think of a football team that the oldest person who can play in this team is 80 years old. And this team is called the Air Quality Team. <clears throat> so this team has a couple of players. We have players from Europe and from the US and basically from the West. And the West is giving us players who are 40 to 45 years old. So these are people who are already uh, experiencing middle life crisis. And sometimes they wonder whether they are really players or they are referees. 
Uh, remember, this is a story on air pollution. Uh, we do have players from the east, uh, mainly from uh, uh, Asia, and they have given us players who are between 18 and 24 years old. Very energetic, looking forward, really taking action, and they're more of in the prime of the game. <clears throat> and then there is Africa, which has given a couple of players between the age of seven to 12 years old, uh, very young. Uh, and these are supposed to be playing the same game of handling or, or controlling air pollution. So the African player are very young, of course, very energetic, but they're looking at the way the older players are playing. And one thing they're learning, they're seeing all the mistakes and they are afraid by the time they are in their 20s to play the game, the game might have changed. And they might actually be the people to change the game. For, for those of you who know how rugby started, is somebody who saw football was so boring and slow and he just picked the ball and ran with it and it was so exciting and rugby was born. So this team here might actually convert the issue of their pollution and take up the ball and, 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 and run with it. So when you're thinking about what's happening in the air pollution space in Africa, think about that game where Africa has given the really young players. They might not be really good at playing the game, but they are very young and looking forward uh, to the game. But most importantly, they are already in the game. So don't think they are out there watching the game. They are inside the pitch, they're playing the game, and they might change the game from uh, a rugby a football game to a rugby uh, game. Uh, so now I go to my presentation. I'll try to be quick uh, if you understand the game theory better. So, so this is, this is a, a table I just uh, put here because I saw in the program my presentation is not in the afternoon and for morning is okay to discuss this. Uh, this is a study that we did uh, maybe two months ago, and we were looking at uh, air pollution awareness in, in Nairobi. And funny enough, uh, around 85% of the population in this city uh, thinks air pollution is related to bad smells or odor. So when they are passing through open sewer, uh, rotting garbage, that is what they associate uh, to be um, uh, air pollution. There was a small group that also were able to pinpoint combustion uh, related sausage and, and also traffic. But most importantly is around 85% of the population in this city uh, do not fully understand uh, what air pollution is and this indicates the level of uh, awareness that we need to create uh, at that level. <clears throat> Uh, some of the major sources of air pollution in the region, and, and that awareness I think cuts across uh, most countries uh, in the region or in Africa. Uh, some of the major sources of air pollution, um, most people say transport is one of the biggest sources, but if you think about most of the African cities, I, I would say waste burning and transport are almost uh, uh, at par. Uh, transport really does impact transport hubs, major uh, highways, but waste burning is more of an area emission source. Uh, there are so many small, small fires uh, that are taking place uh, in Africa. Uh, and waste burning is when you're focusing on uh, urban centers. When you go to rural areas, I, I think burning of agricultural waste uh, is also quite uh, critical. Uh, industries uh, is also a major source. I, I think uh, Selela is not here. Yeah, so Selela mentions uh, or says one of the biggest challenges they have in Nairobi is controlling industrial waste. And I, I, I think there is a lot of work to be done, not mainly on the research side, but in the doing side, in trying to work with the city to really understand what are the ambient standards mean and how do you use those ambient standards to control emissions uh, from industrial sources. Uh, household energy demand, I think Victor uh, did share that a little bit. And, and this is a photo that I took uh, uh, maybe two or three months ago uh, in, in one of the major roads. 
and they were just burning uh, waste openly uh, during daytime. I think it was around 3 p.m. And, and this shows some level of, can I use the word impunity? Yeah, it does show some level of impunity. If you can have that kind of a fire very close to a market and in a big city. So there is a lot of action that is required um, in the enforcement part of issues. I, I think I have heard the words uh, silo. We work in silos for a long time. And, and I think also uh, when, when implementing the project we are doing in Nairobi, the Clean Air Catalyst, I uh, realize this problem is more serious than, than we think. Uh, there is a silo for researchers. These are people who are interested in publications, uh, data, students, and more importantly, some of them are pursuing tenor track. So sometimes they can be very abrasive when pursuing publication data and, and, and students. And for them, that is the only focus they want to do. Uh, in the policy side, um, uh, what they want to see is they want to see change, but they more importantly respond to uh, citizens' demand. And if from the figure I showed you, only 18 per 85% of Nairobians think air pollution is open sewers and rotting garbage. You can trust me, the policymakers are not getting enough pressure to really do this change. And, and this is where also I disclose another thing I was told by a policymaker, and I was told not to share it, and I'm sharing it. Um, we said if, if we want to do some air quality project in Nairobi uh, or in another city, which community should we focus on? And if you look at most of the work done in Nairobi, we focus on the low-income groups. And this, this, this policymaker told me, if you focus on low-income group, that's fine. It's really easy for you to get uh, funded and all those things and have a good story. But the truth is, the low-income groups do not have the political power to push for change. So if you want to push for change, Please focus on middle income groups. And if you can get the politicians, this is even better. Uh, so again, how we frame our questions, how we do our research, uh, need to be, we need to have this kind of open conversations to really strategize how to move forward. Uh, we also have a group of uh, private sector. Um, and these ones would really love to delay regulatory actions. So if they're in the space, uh, their interests are different. Uh, we also have some uh, interesting areas that we call the captured spaces. Most of the emission sources in African cities are what we call captured spaces. The fact that, for example, in Nairobi and most African cities, public transport is mostly run by private sector. So private sector would not be interested in uh, vehicle emission testing and, and all those other nice things that would reduce emissions uh, uh, from the, the public transport. Uh, waste management, I think, if we have the county talking, I, I think they can share with us what's happening in that space. Uh, the county, because of resources constraints, uh, most of the waste management in Nairobi is done by private sector, and they do have very different uh, uh, interests. Industries have different interests, and some of these um, uh, in Kenya, outside the door, we call them cartels. These cartels, some of them have strong political powers, and it's really difficult to transform them. So these are the challenges that we need to think about. And when we are doing research, I, I think some of these spaces need to, to uh, be a focus. Uh, so one of the things that we did when we were implementing the Clean Air Catalyst, and most of you are members of the Nairobi Air Quality Working Group, it's kind of bring all these stakeholders together. Let's talk to each other. Let's hear all the ideas coming from uh, the health people, from the environment people, from the transport people, uh, the, the private sector people. And let us just hear them out with an open mind so that we can see how we can address this. And we did have a very good uh, interaction and it's still ongoing. And the working group is still up and active and those who want to join, you are welcome. You can see myself or Margaret um, or Lemma, uh, who just walked out. Um, so one of the things that this working group uh, was focused on is actually having a shared understanding on air pollution, 
our sources and impacts. And we really learned a lot. Uh, people from health also learned a lot from the researchers. Um, and, and also we needed to talk about uh, drivers of decisions. How are decisions uh, 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 driven um, in, in the space? And this is where some of the conversations on death, premature death versus um, uh, money uh, came out quite strongly. Uh, and how, again, do we monitor progress? I, I think somebody mentioned that Nairobi has registered an improvement of uh, PM 2.5. Uh, that is very interesting. Um, and also we need to also support the, the root cause analysis and disruptability studies. Uh, so for, for those of us interested in research, let's not look at research for air pollution only as monitoring the concentrations, but also is looking at each of those sectors and kind of looking at the priorities and what can be done. So once we established the working group, uh, we did have a couple of uh, subcommittees that are driving some of these uh, conversation. So some of them, we had the health subcommittee that is really trying to support the work on health, sensitizing the health sector workers and players and policymakers and seeing what can be done there. And another thing I needed to mention about health, uh, the city also does collect very good data uh, on health in a portal that is very private, is it? They have a very nice portal that is private, but I was given a sneak peek on it, and there was a lot of very interesting things happening. Uh, one of the things that we noted is um, the number of upper and lower respiratory cases being reported has increased since 2021, uh, increased significantly, and the reason the health sector uh, players think uh, is driving this is because of the lockdown. During the lockdown, there was a turn down of the economic outputs, and most people actually fell back to the poverty lines, which means they moved back to biomass-based fuels, which, if we were monitoring data for Nairobi, we should have noticed an increase of PM2.5 within those years because of use of biomass uh, fuels. Uh, the other subcommittee we have is on gender and community engagement. This is a very hot topic, um, and we have learned a lot. Uh, also, we have a, a sector, uh, a committee looking at private sector, and I have to say the private sector uh, group is actually quite receptive. The private sector in Nairobi, I, I think after the sensitization, they're very open to this, and they are actually listening to what is coming. And, and one of the requests they did put forward is a harmonization between the, sub, the county level and the national level requirement for air pollution. And I think that is an area that uh, we will be looking for partners to work with on. And then we have a policy and, uh, and, and regulatory subcommittee. Um, again, from the initial engagement and what we are doing, uh, one of the things that came out quite strongly is the, getting the data on emissions and concentrations is really good. But we also need kind of a bottom-up, high-resolution emission inventories for African cities. Uh, the emission inventories we have for African city are usually top-down, and some of them do miss a lot. I, I think there was somebody who mentioned about a diesel vehicle in the US and a diesel vehicle in Nairobi, they emit the same. I have to say that is not correct because the one in uh, in US does have a catalytic converter. When it runs in uh, Kenya in Mombasa, we mine the catalytic converter of the precious metals and we actually export them back to, to the US. While in truth we don't have any mining facilities in Kenya for those chemicals. So where are, we, are they coming from? And, and if you ask people who regulate that sector, they tell you we license a lot of exports or some of those particular chemicals. So once the vehicles come to Nairobi or Kenya or East Africa really, we do remove those catalytic converters. So as, as we are speaking now, we do have uh, several people in the field who are trying to collect data to generate a bottom-up high resolution emission inventories for Nairobi. And we are focusing on around six sectors. Transport is one of them, industries, waste burning, uh, eateries, households, and I think a, a few additional ones. 
Uh, the other thing that came out strongly is the need for coordination between government entities. Uh, and I have to use transport again as, as an interesting uh, example. Uh, so, for example, in Nairobi, the county is in charge of really controlling air pollution uh, fully, 100%. That is in the constitution. But they have no powers on vehicles. For vehicles, we do have uh, the Ministry of Transport and a parastat under that, uh, the NTSA, that has all the powers on vehicle importation and all those. We also have uh, the Treasury that kind of regulates uh, uh, vehicle importation. So really, how does the county clean the Nairobi air if they have no power to insist that vehicles need to be tested, they need to have emission control devices, and they need to have these certain age limits. So there is a lot of need to think about how do we coordinate uh, government entities to address this challenge. Uh, monitoring data and uh, air quality tools, I think I mentioned about this. Please, when you collect your data, uh, share with the city. Uh, if it's long term, uh, I think one of the things we are doing under the Catalyst is also uh, developing a, um, a data sharing portal that will be owned 100% by the county and by the national government. So anybody who installs an instrument uh, in the city can feed into that uh, uh, portal. And I think on that particular point, DO, I'll come talk to you. You have one of the best portals I've seen in the region and see how we can borrow uh, some of the ideas you have. Um, use of available infrastructure, for example, for community engagement. There is a lot of work needed there. If we are going to push the politicians, I'm sorry, to really <laughs> take action on air pollution. Uh, uh, Demand-driven capacity or skills uh, transfer. By the way, I just learned the other day uh, that most government officials don't like the word capacity building. Um, it sounds like you're building my capacity. Does it mean I have no capacity? And if you build my capacity, then after you're done, I should have all the capacity I need. So they prefer the word skills transfer. This is, you get these ideas when you have open conversation with policymakers of our drink. It really helps. Um, <laughs> Also, engagement of the political class uh, and also researchers. Uh, historically or personally, I thought when you talk about evidence-driven policy making, I actually thought that the problem was the policy makers. And, and, and I was on that side of research. And you were saying researchers or policy makers, you need to listen to uh, the evidence we are generating. I moved to the policy side and I actually realized uh, researchers are giving us evidence they think we need. They don't even ask us what we need. They just generate evidence and bring to policymakers and say, okay, this is the new evidence, please take action. <laughs> yeah. And then the researchers start complaining. And they complain only in their forums when they're having workshops and conferences that we don't have data-driven, evidence-driven policymaking in Africa. Yes, we don't, because they're not asking us what do we need. But if you do, then they'll tell you exactly what they need. And one of the things that we have heard from our engagement, they are saying, we, we had a couple of discussions, and there was one that came up that we are suffering from what they call research fatigue. I, I, I know there is a lot of research gap that we need to do, but the fatigue is coming from doing too much research especially on monitoring, but no support on the action side. And I think what we heard from the city and from the national government is we need more support in the action side. Of course, we need additional uh, work on, on research, but we also need a lot of work on the action side. The other thing that we have learned from uh, this engagement is policymakers really don't care about you are 95% confidence level. They, they really don't. Um, because they're not trying to publish this data. A, a, and what I have learned is policymakers are okay to start taking action if your confidence is at 70%. If you say, we believe with some 70% confidence. It's 70% is very close to 50-50, yeah? but it's above 50-50. If you tell us you're confident that vehicles are really worsening air pollution in Nairobi, we can start taking action now to make sure it doesn't get worse. 
So again, that conversation between researchers and policymakers need to be moderated, and I'm offering myself to moderate that. And uh, at, uh, with that offer, I stop. Thank you very much for that. Yeah, thank you very much for that very engaging talk. So I think maybe we can take one or two quick questions. Um, thank you so much, George, for such a wonderful presentation. I'm Mwanjiko, I'm with the Respiratory Society of Kenya. And I, at the risk of exposing my ignorance, I know a little bit <laughs> in this area. But I was wondering, is the support on action missing because we probably, I'm, and I'm talking from a clinician's perspective, in terms of measuring impact, are we giving the, are we giving the correct message to both clinicians who can help you be able to support your action? And I'll give you an example. Um, I just, uh, my colleague who is doing a PhD uh, published data from Malawi showing that the lung function was actually, the lung function was declining at the rate of a smoker in patients who are exposed to indoor air pollution. You see, if you package that way to a clinician, to me, that, that data um, caught our attention because we were like, okay, I'm not smoking, but my lung function is declining at the level of a smoker. That's serious to a clinician. So are we packaging? And he was able to measure the impact using a lung function test. So are you doing enough? Or are we doing, I shouldn't say you, I should say, are we doing enough in terms of measuring the impact? We know issues of air pollution, it's all about inflammation. Are we able to capture this inflammation? Are we able to capture lung function decline and perhaps package that. And from my experience in clinic, if I tell a patient, you're gonna die. In Africa, death, I don't think we are scared of death. And I stand corrected. Because there are so many ways you can die. Road accident, uh, TB, I mean, there are many ways, isn't it? But if I tell my patient that you're going to be paralyzed, you know, they fear that. They do not like paralysis. I will not be able to do my business because of hypertension. They'll take medication. But if you tell them die, I can be shot, I can be stabbed, and I'll die. So are we packaging? Is it the problem with packaging? That's my question. And secondly, um, in terms of air, I know this is air, we are measuring the air, but have we thought about fungi? I, in this uh, we, are, we are having a lot of respiratory infections. Is it because, and you went to the low and middle income country, I mean settings, isn't it? Where do they live? Their housing, are there molds, fungi? Could it be the reason we are having more respiratory tract infections and not per se the air? As a clinician, and by the way, I have a PhD, so I'm both a clinician and a researcher, so, but as a clinician, you haven't convinced me that it's really the air. So then how do I package your information to the patient? Are you dealing with fungi? Are you dealing with the just air pollution? You understand? So I think, I don't, I don't know, have you, and are, you do, are there lab tests that can maybe show inflammatory markers are high, you know? The, those are thank you. Thank you for those questions. So if you could respond quickly. Yeah, you, before yeah, I forget, yeah, because yeah, I, yeah. I didn't bring up and I'll, I'll borrow yours shortly. Um, th thank you really for, for that uh, question. I, I think, are we engaging enough? The answer is no. A and I want to put it forward, and Victor, you can note it. We will know that we are engaging enough as they are quality practitioners and health practitioners. The day a doctor in Kenya prescribes a clean cook stove to someone who has a <laughs> an upper or lower respiratory disease, that is the day we know that we have really made inroads and we understand each other and what's happening. Yeah? Yes, yes. When you, when you do that, not medicine today, go buy a clean cook stove. <laughs>
uh, we will really be happy on what uh, we have done. Uh, on the other issues of mold and, and all those things, all of them are really related to uh, air pollution uh, and air quality, either in-house or in the workplace or also outdoors. So all of them are kind of interlinked and is a good challenge for Victor uh, with the Health Institute. Those are good questions that we need to ask. In the poor neighborhoods, we did not even poor neighborhoods, even the rich neighborhoods, some of them really, <laughs> there is a work to really understand indoor air pollution. Is it mainly because of cooking or other uh, sources of air pollutants? But yeah. Thank you very much. So in the interest of time, I'm going to actually stop the questions and move on to the next speaker. Otien is a friend enough, actually, that I can do that to him. So, <laughs> yeah. So please uh, join me in thanking Dr. Moaniki for a very engaging talk. So at this point, Elois, if you're online, I think you're introducing yep. the next speaker. Go ahead. Super. Thanks, Kira. So I'm going to be introducing Dio Okure. And Dio is an air quality scientist who is committed to using his expertise, knowledge, and experience to contribute to developing scalable solutions for environmental challenges in resource strained settings such as Africa and the global south more generally. Dio's background is in mechanical engineering and environmental science, and he also provides scientific advisory support and technical oversight for AIRCO, an Africa-based research team championing new approaches to air quality management in cities in Africa. His current research is in urban air quality and focuses on air quality network development, understanding air pollution sources, and also air quality management and policies. And today he's gonna to be talking about the use of low cost sensors for measuring air quality from the experience of AirQuo. And the stage is yours, Dio. Yeah, thank you for the kind introductions. Um, yeah, so I normally I like to start the conversation with uh, whether we checked our air quality updates when you woke up in the morning. I won't get tripped into asking whether you actually have the app on your phones. Let's assume we all have. So I don't know, anybody, air quality in Nairobi? From what's available, I know that is an issue, but from what is available, does anybody know? Mine was moderate today. From Kitis, Kitisiru, Kitis, where is that? Kitisiru, okay, cool. Yeah, food for thought. So I, I like to refer to Nairobi as uh, an exaggeration of Kampala in many ways. So Victor, I don't know if that's also true for rural settings. Is it that? <laughs> would, would, it, would, would you then say that in Kenya, is also an exaggeration of the rural landscape in Kenya, is an um, amplification of Uganda and not the other way around. <laughs> All right. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Yes, yeah, so I'm going to be talking about really an optimistic view uh, of air quality work in Africa, especially focusing on the data. And um, I think, like Victor mentioned, maybe the tone should also, again, I'm a very optimistic person, but uh, looking at uh, where we've come from, from where we were, say, five, ten years ago, there's a lot more to be done, but uh, there are some lessons you can pick, okay, from what has already been, what we've been able, to, been able to achieve. So looking at two broad research questions, okay? Um, one, uh, the advances in local sensors. Can we adapt the local sensors uh, for sustained monitoring? The key word being sustained, we're not talking about one month, two months, two weeks for a publication, but rather long term for impact. Can we adapt these local sensors to be able to work in our setting? The next research question, again, very, very broadly, looking at the effective avenues. Uh, I think I liked uh, where uh, the point uh, that George was uh, emphasizing on action. What are the effective avenues for using this data? for evidence-informed action. We like to front evidence, evidence this, but then how can we effectively do that? So what I'm talking about really kind of presenting some of the, uh, what you believe are scale of experiences from, from Kampala and some of the game news we've had over time. So I imagine we probably already know a bit about AIRCO, but yeah, from Macquarie University since 2015, and uh, with the vision really, with, uh, with the motivation to close the air quality data gaps in Africa, uh, 
to improve air quality management, of course, in Uganda and broadly in Africa, but trying to see how we can you know, build this uh, very broad-based model, holistic model, that can be replicated in other settings in, Afri in Africa. So we have a rather ambitious vision for clean air for African cities. Uh, the bad news is that uh, that might never happen in our lifetime, unfortunately. I don't know. Uh, I hope I'm wrong. But the good news is uh, I think we are getting there progressively. We are getting there laying a strong foundation to be able to put in place uh, the necessary measures and mechanisms. So I think, again, progressively we see that uh, the landscape is changing uh, from what we had probably uh, maybe five years ago. So I took this screenshot on 26th of March, a few, few days ago. So that's what we see now. Previously, if you went to this platform, maybe five years ago, you wouldn't, uh, you see like very, very scanty, almost non-existent. But I've tried to zoom into, of course, Uganda. So that's from the Airco platform. That's, that's what we currently see. And that's good. And of course, with uh, a few greens as well, that means it's, you know, there's some improvement. I don't know, power of magic? Maybe. Yeah, so uh, the key takeaway is really, um, yeah, of course we see steady growth in the data, the data landscape, but there's still a lot more to be done, all right? In terms of first of all increasing the breadth, the depth and the breadth, depth in the form of uh, the scope of monitoring. We could be at monitoring 2.5, are there other parameters to look at? For example, what happens to order? You know, it's, it's, it's also it's an issue, it's a public health issue. What about um, the gases? You know, we need to also be able to invest in that. Uh, plus, yeah, someone has mentioned fungi. We have fungus, fungi, why not? The way not kind of like, yes, look at, it, you know, the depth and the breadth of monitoring. But at the same time, uh, if you're going to utilize local sensors, really, we also need to be able to uh, standardize some of the protocols, okay? It's okay, we can start from somewhere saying seven day uh, confidence, you know, that's okay, but I think we need to sort of like be able to standardize so that we're able to, the key word, sustain monitoring. If we can't standardize that, then yeah, we'll uh, run into problems. So our work is centered around local sensors. Uh, again, my first research question, can we adapt these local sensors? But I wanted to kind of like recap a little bit in terms of what actually they entail. So the picture on my left, directly on my left, uh, that's a thing, uh, yes, so that's, that's, uh, that's what we see as like an ideal setting. That picture I think was from, from Washington, I, one of the monitoring stations, okay? That's like a very elaborate setup. You, to set that up, you probably need about, um, I don't know, maybe 200,000, 300,000. And if you're talking about dense monitoring, you probably, maybe you need uh, 10 of those in Nairobi, uh, and maybe, I don't know, five in Kampala, where will that money come from? There are other competing priorities, and we also have to be, of course, be mindful of that. Um, yeah, so that's, that's, that's uh, an elaborate setup. Now, when you're talking about locals, so this picture, I think, must, have been, must be from the U.S. mission. Uh, these are the low-cost devices manufactured in Uganda. These are the air cost sensors manufactured in Uganda. And you look at the cost, you know, being brought down to the cost of the devices, make the devices to less than $300. So from, say, one monitor, $30,000, okay? Uh, monitor one parameter and times two for two parameters, that's like $60,000. Now you're bringing that down to less than three hundred dollars. I think that's that's, that's that's a big deal, right? Uh, so in terms of like some of the threshold figures, um, yeah, I think looking at anything between a hundred dollars to two hundred to two thousand five hundred should constitute uh, should fall within what you consider to be low cost. And then uh, then of course uh, there's variations to these, but I think the range between that should be very low cost. And we believe in our setting that's something that can be easily accessible by all the city governments, all the people who are interested in the space. Um, the other key issues to highlight as well, again, looking at that picture, is uh, being able to actually maintain these requires a lot of, uh, you need capacity in terms of technical capacity, but also uh, the, the resources in terms of you know, routine, you need to be able to pay attention to this to get what you need. So that might be a long shot for many given our, our so many other competing priorities, equally important. But also, more uniquely as well, the data retrieval. How do you get data from this? Okay, all those are like massive investments. 
And uh, that brings me to, of course, the research question in terms of can we be able to adapt the local sensors for smart air quality monitoring in African cities? Uh, to answer that, I'm trying to put together what, has, from our perspective at least, what we've been able to have in place, like the data pipeline, okay, starting from the device to, to, to the data. How do you move from zero sensors to, to, to data, okay? So looking at, uh, of course, um, having, you know, from the, date, from the sensor, you get to a network, you'll have a network. From a network, then you'll be able to have, in between that, do quality assurance, maintain the devices, uh, you know, do all the data cleaning, and so on, and so on. Uh, and within this, from in the air core context, we're doing this within a cloud environment. Uh, that, that whole means money, okay? But we're fortunate, of course, to have um, a good technology partner uh, through Google. At least we're able to uh, work, within, work, work within the space to be able to manage all this, the quality assurance, the data access. Then, of course, going uh, downstream to data access, the taxes again, I think I like the, the discussion coming around um, action, how do you reach out to all the different stakeholders? So look at digital platforms as opportunities for that. If you try to segment that, okay, uh, the researchers might be interested in, a print, in the, uh, the, the program you know, interface, like the API, that's okay, that's fantastic, great, go do your papers, but also what about someone sitting at a city who might not necessarily have the time and even the capacity to be able to synthesize that. Can we simplify those million, millions of rows of data into like a simple graph? And can we empower them to be able to generate this themselves? So that's, that's the point of having, that's the point of having uh, uh, this digital, digital dashboard. Then of course for the general public, having a, have a mobile app. I think we are, so we are going to be in the Kampala meeting, I think this is one of the things we're going to be unveiling actually to be able to, that allows all the African, look, everyone, the public really to be able to access uh, data. Uh, just all you need to do is have a smartphone and you can be able to get information and empower yourself and take the necessary action. I hope I still have the audience. <laughs> yeah. It gets a bit, gets a bit emotional, right? <laughs> can get. <laughs> okay, cool. Yeah, I think in terms of, that's a bit of a recap. Yeah, uh, we're trying to scale up and you know, you know, deploy networks, at least for now, uh, in this number of countries, some selected cities in these countries. But also more uniquely, looking at uh, trying to address the gap of work in silos, okay? If I know there's this sensor deployment in Kenya, uh, in Nairobi, then where should I bring more sensors? Maybe that's maybe what they're lacking is a digital platform. So, and I'm glad to say that, uh, you know, the, the dots you see here is not that because we deployed in Madagascar, we've only deployed in these number of countries, but uh, you see in Madagascar, you see Sudan, is because the digital platform has enabled that access. Okay, if someone has their data point, it's okay, we can onboard that so that people can be able to access without having to rely, okay, fine, we don't need to first have the physical device in the city. So that's a unique kind of like uh, um, approach to recognize uh, to add value to the uh, uh, ongoing efforts by the different players. Um, yeah, so that's it about the first research question that uh, I think with uh, the right tools and the right resources, we should be able to package these sensors to be able to work um, in our setting, at least for sustained monitoring. The next research question is, uh, I think, the million dollar question on action. So what are the effective ways of utilizing this data now we're generating? Now you have the data pipeline, the infrastructure is there, you can access it, but then what does that mean for action? Okay, which I think uh, many people, of course, would, uh, would struggle with. So progressively, and of course the keyword is progressive, it's not like uh, today, I have this day and tomorrow, and then there'll be action, but I think being able to get to the room, and I think uh, George has done a good job in trying to get the communities in Kenya you know, together. Let's, let's start talking. So progressively, we'll, we'll be able to uh, come together and do something. So I think just kind of some highlights. In terms of how we do this, uh, looking like a broad scan of the different, uh, uh, the stakeholder landscape, uh, we think air quality is very, has a very, has a strong convening power in, this, in the sense that it affects everybody. 
and that means you can easily talk to someone about you know air pollution and their health and that means uh, it's easy to kind of like have like a broad scan of different stakeholders so right from policy uh, this is Kisumu right from Kisumu on policy uh, academia civil society or development partners the US mission has been a great uh, great partner uh, community, you know, work with our research organizations, UNEP, uh, and community. Yeah, thanks, George, for the reminder on the CAT converters. Have, have a unique, um, yeah, we have, we have a, I don't know if testimony is the right word, but uh, we know that, of course, transportation is one of those key issues, at least for our cities, for reasons that uh, George already explained. So one thing we did, looking at that broad scan of the different stakeholders, to look at uh, what would be, if you want to influence action within the transport sector, uh, who, would, who would those be? So we identified mechanics as a very, a very powerful group, actually. They are trained informally, at least for Kampala, informally, learn on a job, but they're very powerful. Uh, everyone here who owns a car will tell you, when the, when the mechanic says something, you listen to it. So we said, well, why, why can't we talk to that group? And tell them about, first of all, you know, look at this digital, engage them on the data, on the evidence, and try to see, are there things they can do? And one of the things, of course, that all of them at least uh, uh, admitted to is uh, issue of cut converters. Yeah? These guys are taking this away, they're doing this, and that's eventually affecting us. And I'm glad to report that actually through that engagement, we've been able to, the Minister of Works and Transport is uh, developing uh, garage regulations. And this was like, this experience was very good, actually it was very useful in trying to inform uh, certain aspects of that. And that's kind of, so you, you're regulating for the people, uh, not necessarily to sit, to have it as one of the lists of the many uh, regulations or policy outputs we have in place, but at least there's some evidence, uh, some tangible contribution from the affected people. So that was a good experience. This is ongoing, but the idea is to be able to have, package this into something that is rep can be replicated. Uh, across, but also that can be, be sustained. So that's just like one very unique, uh, again, just one stakeholder group, but again, look at how we can bring on board all the different uh, players. So that's one experience, of course. The other one, of course, is around capacity. Capacity, uh, we know that uh, uh, is we can't just assume that when you publish a paper, then, uh, you know, you just give it to to the to the city, then that should be able to do something. I think it goes beyond that. We also have to recognize that even even within the research itself, there's lots of research areas that we have not touched on. This is fairly new new a new area for 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 Africa. So that means we need to be very deliberate. So one thing you've done, of course, is to through uh, the data do some hands-on onboarding. Uh, can we, you know, package this information, especially using digital digital platforms? Okay, can, can we be able to empower the, the, the key people to be able to, for example, generate their own reports on air quality, do actual hands-on training, um, what about the, the school, what can they bring on board in terms of that, can we deliver some of these as, you know, as challenges? When you do mathematics, you know, there used to be uh, things around statistics, yeah, where can we have actual equity data for that, for them to use that, and even do some challenge around that, so that at least in a way we're kind of talking to everybody, uh, so there's several versions to that really, but I think the point really is to look at capacity as a key issue and that, that's really, really cross-cutting. Um, yeah, thrown some figures there in terms of what to see tracking some of the progress made. Uh, at least through this, we've been able to at least engage over 400 uh, government uh, people, not just in Uganda, but even across, we need to engage them on actually getting some of these very useful uh, skills and of course working with students. Uh, the question I know you're asking is, where do you get all the money to do all this work? We need to be very, very, remember when you're, when you're talking low cost, it doesn't stop at the sensor. Even the way we engage, eh, this requires money. So one thing we do is, given that this is a common problem, this is affecting everybody, we have resources that are available within the different stakeholders. So if, let's say, I want to organize a meeting, I know that uh, there's a free meeting room, for example, the US mission has a free meeting room with computer facilities. I don't need to pay any money for that. Why can't I take the meetings there? I don't need to come to a hotel. But also, uh, progressively, what I don't like, of course, sorry, sorry, Victor, coming to, you know, trying to um, 
always default to no let's let's we have a workshop okay fine which hotel are we going to okay let's normalize this conversation say no no it's okay we are going to the boardroom of cases here we are going to the boardroom of the city county we are going to we're going to go to a school there's a community center there so that is more it, it's uh we normalize it's, it's closer to it's closer to the people but when you try to present it in a certain way then yeah uh, it gets a bit intimidating in some ways. So that also answers the question of how do we be able to, like, how do you actually fund some of these things? They're actually innovative ways. And I think in Kampala we'll be talking about some of these things, some of these details, how you can effectively be able to reach out to many people without having to have tangible budget, but through uh, in-kind participation. Uh, yeah, this is something we are very, at least progressively, we've been able to have this mainstream. Uh, Annually, we have air quality awareness week on the first week of May, where all the different players in the air quality community actually come together and we speak one voice, and that, that starts with, uh, with a, uh, a press conference at the National Media Center. So taking the conversation, you know, the top of the, uh, at, at the highest level, really, of, of governors, so that at least we know that this is something that's important for the country. And uh, that still answers the question of, how can we effectively uh, use this data for, for action through tackling capacity, uh, awareness, uh, what's the other one, and uh, uh, targeted community engagement. Uh, yeah, just recently we had the air quality, we had the car free day. Uh, we also see those as avenues. Uh, it could have been motivated by, let's say, road safety or something like that. But where are the avenues for mainstreaming air quality action? That should be like the key question. Where, where are some of those avenues? Okay, do we have, I don't know, environment awareness week somewhere or somewhere that we do here that maybe is focusing on uh, water, uh, landfills, or anything else? Yeah, how can air quality plug into existing? So we don't, we are not creating things from, from we are not creating from scratch. Um, yeah, so those are the two research questions and uh, my uh, my last slide in terms of defining the future of air quality management. I want to end with this, this paper that, uh, yeah, I can't talk research questions without defining the paper, right? Uh, yeah, so we did a scoping review uh, uh, recently, looking at scanning through the 20 years of air quality research in Africa. Uh, that work was, uh, was led by Gabriel, who likely has joined us here today. But just in brief, looking at uh, the progress made for the last 20 years in Africa, starting from 2020, sorry, 2000 until 2020. So uh, the strategy is at the tail end. Uh, tail end, I mean, kind of like at action, like um, I would say maybe end of pipe. We found that uh, technology, I think most of the strategies, technology is 75%, policy 20%, uh, education, behavioral change, um, uh, 5%. Uh, of course, with the caveat that when it's technology, we are not talking about it. it's more of like real detail. And most of the strategies, uh, over 80 percent, was focused on indoor air quality. And I think uh, the efforts around in the recent past has been really very much around uh, trying to close the gaps in the outdoor in the outdoor space as well. Uh, but of course, I think this is interesting to see where the efforts should be. But looking at maybe what should be the future when they're trying to draw effort, where should be. Uh, the future. I think across the, all the three spheres, there's still a lot of work to be done on, on all. Because I think uh, things like capacity that really do cut, do cut across uh, technology, we're still focusing. This is the tail end, but what about technology for bringing the data to the people? Okay, data access, how can we bring down the costs of monitoring and so on and so on? Behavioral change, policy, how can we move air quality monitoring to the taxpayer? By that I mean, do we now have like how we the way we monitor noise, what, and, and everything else, can that now be normalized and then it's closed taxpayer? So uh, I would stop here. Uh, but this with a quick stock take of what we're doing in the space in Africa. Thank you. Super, thanks, Dio. Thanks for giving us a really great overview of some of the actions that are being taken by you and uh, related organizations on trying to enhance communication of uh, air pollution as well as build capacity to monitor it. I'll now hand, uh, hand over to my co-chair, Kiras, who will take any questions. All right, uh, thank you very much. One quick question, we're running out of time, and then we'll move on. Uh, 
thank you very much for the presentation and also for the presentations before you. Mine is to share an experience of um, uptake of health research, which was enhanced by collaboration. Now, when we take the case of HIV AIDS in Kenya or in Africa, you find that there used to be a lot of collaboration between researchers, practitioners, uh, funders, and uh, policy makers. Now, in the University of Nairobi where I work, some of the clinicians who are researchers were also co-opted as policy makers. Because when you do research, you have the end game in your mind. So when you give out that research to somebody else who didn't do it, and doesn't know even how it was conceptualized, it becomes a bit difficult to operationalize it. So they used to work all the way. So uh, one of the recommendations probably that will come later is to recommend that um, we do intensive collaborations between researchers, practitioners, and the policy makers. Thank you for that question. Yeah, thank you. The word I didn't mention here was co-design. Yes, so I think uh, the opportunity, and I think that's something you've brought out as well nicely. I think co-design right from, you know, at, at the conceptual stage of you coming up with your research proposal, where is, uh, where is the city, where is, uh, where is, where is NEMA, where is uh, the county government, where is everybody else who needs to be there? So that then when you're designing that, you're not, you're not prescribing your solutions, but rather, you first of all, you are defining the problem together, and then, so then the researchers will then go to sort of trying to find answers to those problems. And I, th I think that's, a, that's something that's commendable. And of course, we are, we are very, uh, we are proud that we've been able to at least uh, try to adopt that model. Uh, yeah, sorry, I've forgotten this. I think with some, uh, uh, at the regional level, of course, we actually do have some uh, formal collaborations with city, with the regional cities, that's Kampala, Nairobi, and Kisumu, uh, plus, plus many other cities within, within, um, uh, within Uganda uh, and across. But I think, yeah, I think co-designing is actually, it's, it's, it's uh, I mean, it's also increasing the chance of getting uh, the grant, no? <laughs> this impact, you demonstrated it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for this very interesting talk. Um, so now we come. Please. Now we come to the last speaker of this session, uh, Dr. Rebecca Garland from University of Pretoria in South Africa. She's going to speak to us about opportunities for using integrated methods for air quality assessment. Just to give a brief introduction, uh, Dr. Rebecca Garland is an associate professor in the Department of Geography geoinformatics and meteorology at the University of Pretoria. She has over 20 years of experience in atmospheric science research and her group's research focuses on improving understanding of air quality and atmospheric science in Southern Africa, focusing um, you know, um, on uh, issues including evidence-based air quality management planning in a regional to urban scale. Dr. Garland is joining us uh, virtually. Uh, please take it away. Great. Um, thank you. Can you hear me okay and see my slides? Yes, we do. Thanks. Great. We do see Great. your slides as well. So, okay, thanks. So, asante nisana to the chairs and the organizers for inviting me. I do wish I could be there with you all. This has been a really interesting meeting and I'm looking forward to further discussions. Um, as was in my bio, I am in South Africa and our work focus is here, so not part of East Africa, but I wanted to highlight some of the ways we've been able to integrate different data streams um, as examples of what potentially could also um, assist air quality management in East Africa as well. Um, so in data scarce regions, I think this tug of war happens often and George, or whose name I now know as Honey, um, talked about it as well. And sometimes this happens in our head, right? Even as scientists or practitioners or policymakers, we need to make a decision. No, no, we need better information. No, no, we need to make a decision. It also can happen between different stakeholders. And just as George also stated, you know, we do have some information though. So with that information that we have, 
what conclusions can we make and what decisions can we make? I think many of us have had the had it happen before where, you know, with the getting something done, perfection gets in the way. But we do have something and what can we do with it? And one of the way also to help to get some of the information is to integrate different data sources. The pictures that came up are just a whole bunch of different types of data as well. And if we can combine them, we can also help to mitigate the shortcomings of any of the one um, of the individual data sets. And so that's the focus of today, just some examples of what we've been working on and in integrating different information. Um, a lot of what we do focusing on this is to support air quality management in South Africa, but also the questions that we start with are, you know, what can we do with all of this globally available information that we've seen and how can we improve it? And sometimes we can't, sometimes they have the best information already, but sometimes we do know of local data that we can improve it or by putting data streams together, we can also improve it. I want to note that the work is highly collaborative. You'll see lots of logos and affiliations because we're a very small group and we aren't experts in everything. And so we do try to collaborate with experts on this. And what we found works best is collaboration, um, but where the leads are local, as we know the data and the policy context and all and the other contexts as well. Just to highlight here, emissions are in gray because to me they're one of the they're the starting point for a lot of this work. And we do do a lot of work on trying to improve emissions. Just a quick um, highlight of, as I said, I'll be talking most, I'll be talking about our work in South Africa. And a lot of our work happens in Hauteng province. And I just wanted to provide an overview to also show that a lot of the challenges in Hauteng would be similar to cities um, across East Africa as well. So we have high ambient levels of pollution. They exceed our national standards. Very often, this is particulate matter and ozone. We have high spatial heterogeneity of emissions, of concentrations, as well as vulnerability. And this picture here at the bottom shows one of our low-income settlements next to Santon, which is very, very rich. And then we have just next to it a very poor area. And we also have the highest levels of particulate matter are found in these low-income areas. We have a mix of anthropogenic and natural sources. And again, this is very true for many places across Africa. Here we have a lot of biomass burning, um, similar to many places in East Africa. And then in North Africa, for example, there's a lot of desert dust. So we're impacted by our local sources from community-based burning of waste to regional sources, such as the large scale biomass burning. We do have data scarcity as well. We are lucky in South Africa to have ambient monitoring stations, regulatory ambient monitoring stations. This map here is of Hao Tang. I'm not certain if the dots are very clear, but the dots show the data capture rate. So even though we have lots of station, quite a few of the capture rates, these are percentages, are quite low. And so they, or it can be variable across years. So sometimes we have challenges in the trends that we can look at. Um, we only have criteria pollutants as well. So while we're lucky with monitoring data, we do still consider it you know, to have um, some scarcity as we have some challenges with it. But as we've been talking today, our quality data are not the only data that we need, right? We also, we don't have high resolution health outcomes. We have a lot of uncertainty in emissions and we'll talk about that now, in particular natural emissions. Um, and then in a recent project, one that I'll talk about at the very end, we found that we couldn't access the data for industry of what controls that they use. So if we are to do a scenario in the future saying industry should do X, Y, and Z, we don't know if industries already are doing X or Y or Z because this information they deemed was commercially sensitive. So it really runs the gamut of this data scarcity. In addition, we found that we don't have many quantified future scenarios. For greenhouse gas emissions, most countries do have a stated pathway, but we don't have the same thing for air quality. Although the current African assessment, which we've heard about today, will help with this as well. But again, with the status scarcity, I don't want to um, dwell on it very long. We need to move forward.
So just some of the examples. First, as I said, emission inventories. For South Africa, they're definitely the largest uncertainty in air quality modeling and management. And George also noted the importance of high resolution emission databases. We can kind of see what you can get if you look at a lower spatial resolution. So on the top here, this is Etiquani, this is the Indian Ocean. The city is kind of in the middle here. And these are emissions from transport, from a global emission inventory and from a local one that is higher resolution. And in the higher resolution one, I hope you can see, we can start to see the roads even coming through. So this was a different methodology, but even coming down to a higher resolution, we can get some more of that urban heterogeneity that we know exists in our urban areas. And so generally, you know, thinking of emissions from other cities as well, you know, the question we ask a lot for our work, and I think other emission inventory people do as well, is what source can we improve, even if it's just a little bit, even if it's that first step with local data? For example, you know, here we can at least get where the roads are better for that. We can start to disaggregate. And input data, even for the local and for the global, have large assumptions. But even with a little bit of local information, we can improve this. And this is something that the Gaia African Working Group is working on, trying to develop higher resolution emission inventories for the country while working with um, scientists within that country. And from this, from our emissions work, we really have improved the modeling as well as improved air quality management through there as emission inventories, as I said, are the bedrock for a lot of this. Another example of integrating information is this where we integrated both simulated exposure. So I know there's a lot on this slide, but basically what we've done is taken the ambient concentrations the vulnerability index, and this is a high resolution data set that we had to try to estimate health risk. And again, even if, as George was saying, there's uncertainties within this, at least we now start to see with these two aspects together, where are areas of concern? And then we can go forward and say, well, if we do different policies, how do they affect the health risk from the most vulnerable communities? as well. So a different type of integrating data um, in order to support air quality management. And then to finish on this discussion of integrating different data sets, I wanted to highlight some work with reduced complexity models. Um, and the motivation for reduced complexity models, I think, was perfectly summed up by my collaborator at Carnegie Mellon University, where he said, we want low cost models as well as low cost sensors. And I hope at least the AirCo group are smiling at that comment. Um, but that's what we can think of reduced complexity models. In short, we try to make statistical relationships or sometimes more complex relationships between changes in emissions to changes in ambient concentrations and changes in impact. And reduced complexity models, once we set up these relationships, it allows for scenario and impact assessments without the use of chemical transport models, so without chemical um, complex air quality models. And there are many different forms of reduced complexity models. Some that people might have heard of are GAINS or NMAP, um, Eurasia and REACH are in um, the US in particular that we've developed in REACH South Africa. Also LEAP IBC, I believe some people could be familiar with LEAP IBC. And with these, once we set up the relationship as researchers of a change in emissions, what does it do to ambient and therefore the health impacts, that then we can easily pull policy levers to see, well, if I do this, I don't have to run an air quality model. I can rather use a reduced complexity model and we can look at different scenarios. Um, and with this, you know, there can be many different uses of reduced complexity model, uh, models. A lot of times it is to help and have discussions with different policies, as you can run scenarios, you know, together with a policymaker or, you know, with a little bit of training on the model, the policymaker can also look at the different scenarios themselves to inform impact studies. And actually how I got involved in it was training. We want to do, um, train our students to think like air quality modelers and even to start air quality modeling. And not all of them, most of them won't stay in academia. Many in South Africa go into the government and industry, but then they'll have this view of how to use such models to support um, to support decision making.
again, we have some uncertainties in data, but they, can they tell us enough? Can they get us enough information? So just to end up, I'll show a few results using the GAINS integrated assessment uh, model, which is a reduced complexity model. So once we've set up the model, we can easily change emissions and see what happens to ambient PM 2.5. Um, what you can see on the right hand side is just an example of emissions, as I said, the most imp the starting point for a lot of this. But what we'll be looking at are the ambient impacts. And GAINS has a default value for South Africa. It has default values for every country. And what we looked at, as I said at the beginning, was, well, what is there and how can we improve upon these? And we did work together with IASA, who's created, um, who created GAINS. And so we used local information as best we could when we knew we had better information. And sometimes what was already in GAINS was already the information that we had. So we tried to improve the characterization of the sources, ambient concentrations and impacts, and also then what we applied it to were different policy scenarios. And just to note, this is preliminary findings, so please don't share this yet. We're still doing our final stakeholder engagement. So this first one I'm showing you in emission space, I hope it's not too small on your screen, um, but it's really the size of the bars that we need to look at. What we first looked at is if we're standing in 2020, and for modeling sake, this is a COVID-free 2020. So if I'm in 2020, what would the emissions have been if we had done nothing since 2005? And this is in Hauteng province in South Africa. So in 2020, we're saying for NOx emissions, we're here. This is just different baselines, but the same thing. For PM2.5 emissions, we're here. And for SO2 emissions, we're here. But if we had done nothing, we would have been at these other bars on the right-hand side. So if we had done nothing since 2005, this simulated scenario said we would have had a lot more NOx emissions. We would have had a lot more PM2.5 emissions and a little bit more SO2 emissions. So with this, you know, even though there are uncertainties and even though we can't go back in time and change things, it at least shows, well, from this model, we have made some progress. This is a long road and it needs continuous effort, but we have made some progress at least. But we're not there. We still have exceedances of our standards. So then what we looked at was, okay, how can we meet our standards? So how by the year 2030, can we go from our baseline value, and the left-hand side is what I just showed you. These are PM 2.5 um, emissions. How can we go from our baseline to 20 micrograms per meter cubed, which is our annual standard? You can see this is a large decrease in emissions. So this is where we will be in 2030 if we continue as we are. This is where we want to be. So this is one of the key state take home messages from this was this really large decrease in emissions that we need. Also, if you see this optimized scenario, the one right next to it is the maximum feasible reduction. The costs of the maximum feasible reduction are about three times more expensive than this optimized target to really get you just a little bit change in emissions. So it really shows, you know, using the costs as well, as George noted, are important you know, to communicate what can we do cost effectively. And just to finish up before my summary slide, this is, I thought, a very interesting way to look at the ambient concentrations. This also comes out of gains. And what it is, is what on average are the PM 2.5 concentrations in our province? And so this is concentrations now here and broken up by natural. But you can see natural already gets us to the five and five micrograms per meter cubed is the WHO guideline. So this is towards annual standards. Again, there could be uncertainties in here, but even if it's maybe three, we're still getting very close to our five. Then the pollution coming from outside of Hautang gives us about another five. And then we see the sources that contribute on average across the, the from inside Hautang itself, from increase the province. With this, we really see that all sources are important and many still are uncertain. And in setting guidelines and setting standards, rather, sorry, setting standards, we do need to know what our natural background is, as there isn't very much that we can really do about that. And these types of scenarios, I think, should also be used to determine air quality pathways and the just energy transition. How we do this transition matters to air quality. Um, as well, a lot of the talk is in 2050 will be net zero, but how we get there will impact our quality today. 
Um, I'll come back to my concluding thoughts. I just wanted two quick plugs. I hope it's okay with the um, with the organizers and the chairs. One is that to plug for ANGA, which is the African Group on Atmospheric Sciences. We're a regional working group under the under IGAC, the International Global Atmospheric Chemistry Program. And we're really working to develop collaboration between African atmospheric scientists. Um, we'll share the list also with HEI and how to join our mailing list. And also for research papers on African air quality, there's the Clean Air Journal. Our focus is on air quality and atmospheric science in and of relevance to Africa. And in just in our la latest issue, we also had a news item that um, described the summary for policymakers for the integrated assessment and also had some information on how to use the data that are coming out of it since it will be open. And so just with some concluding thoughts, as I have run a bit over time, um, but you know, even with data scarcity, there is some information and we have been working to update global products with some local data that we know of and providing high resolution and local information is key. And then also through that, we can highlight where the really the key gaps in order there's some questions we can't answer yet because we don't have enough information. Um, and the open and accessible data needs are large and wide ranging, not just ambient air quality data, but more as well, as well as scenarios. And I know we've been talking quite a bit about the integrated African assessment, and I know that you'll also be hearing about it tomorrow as well. Um, and that really a lot of our work, and I know from everybody in the room work is highly collaborative as well. And so just to conclude, thank you to the organizers of the workshop for inviting me. Cheers. Thank you very much, Dr. Garland, for that very interesting talk. So now we are going to turn to a few questions, um, but we'll start with uh, the audience, you know, from online because we have been ignoring them so far. I'll, I'll start with um, two questions that are kind of combined and similar. One is from Masorat Abdisa. It's, uh, the question is, can we trust air quality data produced using satellite information if we know there are limited ground monitoring stations? And a second related question from Solomon Tasso Saboka is what's the credibility of local sensors for measuring PM levels in households? These are kind of general, any one of the speakers could take it on. Um, yeah, go ahead. Go but ahead. I just, okay. <laughs> Um, maybe to, towards the first question on the satellite data and how can we trust the, the data if we don't have ground-based um, sensors. And that's very, very true when we're trying to look at satellite data going to ground-based. And a lot of the global data products um, are based upon that. And we have seen in South Africa where we have some monitoring data that they are there's large uncertainties in these sets that use, um, that use satellite information um, <laughs> with that. So we can start by deploying some sensors to at least spot check, but also I think bringing some of these data together as well. If we have some modeling and if all some satellites, some measurements, and little bit by little bit, if these pieces start to point us in the same direction, even if there are uncertainties, you know, we can use that. Another key thing that satellite information can be used for is when regional pollution is really affecting your city. So we can see when a plume of biomass burning is coming, right? And that pollution levels might be higher, and that's a regional contribution. We can also see in dust storms when those are happening in North, Northern Africa. And so I think we also should try to think of innovative ways to use the satellite information, even if there are um, some uncertainties with that. Thank you very much. Uh, anything to add from the other speakers? Um, there is a second question on credibility of local sensors for household, in, household pollution. Yep. Uh, of course, the caveat for me is that I don't, I'm not, you know, that's not the space I'm working, uh, I'm working in terms of, I'm not in indoor, indoor air pollution space. Uh, maybe Gabriel could, could, and other people might be in a better position. But uh, maybe I'll speak to the credibility of local sensors in general. Uh, with limited access to reference monitors, and I mean limited, I mean by having just one or two reference monitors in a city, you can be able to improve the sensors 
or the quality of the data that can bring it to a level that could actually be able to inform action. And by that, I mean comparable to what is considered as a reference monitor, uh, what we could say as a standard, as established, as reference monitors. Uh, so whether that could then be I mean, the same for our soil as well, maybe someone else could take that. But in general, local sensors can actually be, you can be able to improve, as I think I demonstrated in there. So I don't know if anybody wants to take on the other. The other. Gabriel. Yeah, I think uh, you can trust the, the local sensors are credible for household air pollution if they are calibrated. The, the caveat is you have to calibrate them uh, before you start, um, and also depending on the duration of your, uh, of, of your experiment uh, or of your project, you might need to calibrate them after, uh, after a few months and then uh, towards the end. So the key factor there would be calibration. Thank you very much. So maybe uh, a related question maybe to Dio Akure, uh, where are the local sensors built locally? How did you account for heat, humidity, and power sources? Uh, yes, the local sensors are uh, built uh, locally, but locally, Macquarie University. Gideon, you want to respond to heat, humidity, and power sources? <laughs> yeah. Um, Gideon is my colleague who is in the uh, thank you, thank you for the question, um, Gideon. Again, um, so on the question of heat and humidity, this is a this is a thing that we have uh, in our low cost monitors. We are also measuring those uh, two parameters, and in the calibration models, to try to get um, the reading close as close to the reference monitor as possible, we use this data on um, humidity and temperature to correct our data. Thank you. Great. Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, maybe if there are any questions from the audience here, we can take maybe one or two. As we wait for the question, one of the things uh, just popped into my mind uh, about uh, measuring household air pollution, especially if you're measuring in probably kitchens where they're using a lot of biomass, the other things that you need to really take care of is uh, uh, you need to look at uh, the maximum the maximum concentration me measured by that device. So if, you ha if you're going to measure with a device that uh, let's say measures uh, 500 micrograms per cubic meter and then you're going to put it in a, in a small kitchen, beyond that it won't measure. So you need to notice the limit of detection. You need to be aware of the limit of detection of the device. Uh, that is also really, really crucial. And also you need also to be um, careful whether you're monitoring person exposure or stationary exposure. So putting a device here for the whole day might not necessarily mean uh, that is the exposure we have gone through. Because so, sometimes we're getting out of the room, so people do different activities within the household. The mother who is in the kitchen cooking, and probably Victor who comes here for the workshop and then goes back home and sits in the sitting room waiting for food, they might not have the same exposure. Sorry, Victor. <laughs> Right. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, so I don't see any hands, but while we're waiting, one more question from the uh, online audience. Uh, from Rodaweni Legri, I hope I'm see saying the name right. I think this is directed to Dr. Rebecca Garland. Uh, what model are you using for air quality modeling and uh, what space time resolution? Yeah, thanks. So uh, for the air quality modeling studies using the chemical transport model, we've used the, the CSIR in South Africa, their setup, which uses WARF as the meteorological input and CAMEX as the chemical transport model. And it's a very complex system. There's one person in the country who can run it effectively. Um, and that gives you information at one hourly um, and we do high resolution of about one to six kilometers, depending where we're looking. But for the reduced complexity models that I was talking about, we've used a few and we're trying to test different ones out um, and comparing them to the air quality model, the chemical transport model, to see if the reduced complexity models um, perform as well. And those are generally run on an annual average. And so you don't have the time steps, you look at a change in annual emissions to a change in annual average concentrations, and then using a relationship, a dose response relationship to get to the health impacts. Thank you very much. Uh, all right, Thanks. so good. So I don't, I don't see any hands up. I know we are uh, standing between questions and lunch, so maybe people have migrated towards lunch already. So uh, I would like to thank all the speakers 
um, and also the live audience and the many uh, virtual audience. I think I believe we have uh, close to 45, 46, uh, you know, participants online. Uh, before we close, um, I would like to turn this, uh, you know, uh, to turn the, you know, the stage to uh, my co-chair uh, Eloise, if she has any um, concluding remarks. Yeah, I'm also very aware that I am standing between <laughs> um, the audience and lunch, but I thought I would just very quickly wrap up what was an exceptionally gra great session um, to just maybe draw on some of the the key uh, cross-cutting themes that occurred. There's a lot of text on here, and I'm going to be very, very, very brief. But certainly what came across all of those four talks was the need for economic and budget impact estimates uh, to motivate uh, action the need for reliable, open access, continuous and representative observations, as well as data for developing these high resolution emission inventories, including information about control technologies. And of course, as Re Rebecca showed us, data gaps do lead to creative data integration and development of uh, tools that are better fit for purpose. And we've seen that low cost sensor technology revolution is really addressing monitoring gaps uh, Indoor air pollution, the elephant in the room, remains a large contributor to exposure and we do need a better understanding of how it's influencing exposure to air pollution. There's this critical need for local exposure studies as well as ease of access to higher resolution, very detailed health data. And there's general public misunderstanding of what air pollution is, where it's coming from, what it does. And so this does require this targeted far reaching communication approach as well as community engagement and we've seen examples of how this is working effectively so there certainly is a model to follow key to effective action of course is the synergistic collaboration crossing sectoral divides and key to action is identifying viable cost effective pathways uh, to meet guideline standards as well as net zero ambitions and of course we've seen examples of how we have this empowerment through skills development so it represents a really crucial component of um, air quality understanding and policy development. And with that, I'll wrap up and uh, you can all head off to lunch. Yeah, thank you very much, Elois, for that wonderful summary. And please join me again to thank you know, all the speakers and uh, my co-chair, Elois, as well. And with that, I think I turn it on to Victor. Thanks, Kiros. Um, 